I'm so excited to bring to you the Academy i3 podcast. This is a series of podcasts where we lead with open hearts and open minds to inspire, inquire, and impact the workforce. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this episode brought to you by the Academy of Professional Excellence. For this episode, we'll be focusing on the topic of trauma-informed. So I'd love to pitch it over to our guest, um, Nicole, to be able to introduce herself, um, share a little bit about you know, your role, how long you've been in your role, and a little bit about just sort of the impact that you see um, within your role. So Nicole. Yes. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, I am a practice coach supervisor with the Academy for Professional Excellence. I've been in, um, I've been with the Academy for six years, always working within the coaching realm and being able to work alongside child welfare workers to help them improve their best practice. And so um, just a little tidbit on that, and I'm sure your listeners have this information, but, you know, coaching is really about application of that information to the field. And um, it can cover a gamut of things and, and things kind of come up when we're out there. So, um, so uh, I've been doing this for almost six years. And one of the things that really, um, I call it co- uh, coaching goosebump moments. It's those times when uh, we're out coaching with uh, workers in the field and you really see that, we call them those aha moments, you know, where that light bulb turns on and, and they really, the practice clicks and uh, it really impacts the families in our communities. and potentially changes the trajectory of a family's outcome and potentially reducing the trauma on uh, that family. And so that's kind of, that's my impact and, and why I do what I do. That's awesome. That's really awesome. I, I think, you know, once you can start to see that, you know, there is sort of those moments of impact, you know, the work becomes a lot, you know, pretty meaningful too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So, so within our topic today of, of trauma-informed care, um, would love to kind of hear a little bit more about just sort of the, the trauma 101, um, if you will, that I think a lot of our listeners could benefit from hearing. So maybe share a little bit about just um, your knowledge and experience with, with the, the trauma 101 and maybe the impact of that, uh, of the trauma on the work environment. Yeah, yeah. And um, before I dive too deep in it, I just want to call out some terms. And one of them is secondary traumatic stress. Uh, Also, we oftentimes hear uh, compassion fatigue and also vicarious trauma. And while there is some similarities and differences between uh, some of them, the terms are often used interchangeably. And for our conversation today, we'll use those interchangeably. So I just wanted to call that out. Uh, But I also wanted to say that um, secondary traumatic stress is not burnout. So sometimes we say somebody's burnt out and it's really secondary traumatic stress or vicarious trauma. And I just wanted to call the difference between those two. Burnout is completely um, uh, uh, because of the work environment. So those long work hours, that extensive paperwork, that sort of stuff. Um, So that's not what we're talking about today. So I just wanted to clarify that from the get-go. And um, so secondary traumatic stress is really the impact of experiencing other people's trauma. So in the child welfare field, we know that we go out and we see some very dire situations uh, and even have some very um, serious things that happen and on caseloads and and children that were uh, overseeing the the outcome of of what's happening in that family. And and sometimes things happen that are unforeseen and it really has a, a strong impact on us. And even even if it doesn't happen in that moment and it's something where we're intervening afterwards, we hear those stories repeatedly every day. And so that really takes a toll on those in the child welfare uh, social work field. And so that's really what we're gonna be talking about today. So, um, and there's, um, and it really uh, is very similar to like PTSD in terms of symptomatically. Um, so you may have uh, hypervigilance, so where you're completely alert of everything that's going on. If, if you think somebody who's experienced trauma, they're just ready for the next impact. And so kind of this, even like defensiveness or um, uh, sometimes it could be uh, withdrawing from the situation or, you know, or emotional withdrawal or um, some rigidity in thinking. Um, uh, maybe it, it can even be like uh, physical symptoms, like inability to sleep. Um, um, it can also be um, like uh, feeling helpless, sadness. So the, that gamut of emotions where we typically think through like PTSD type of situations very much can play itself out in a secondary traumatic stress situation. 
Right. Yeah. And, and not only does it impact sort of the, the individual, but I can imagine it has sort of an impact um, onto the team or, or onto just sort of their, their function of the work as well. So, um, I mean, I, I guess, have you heard or experienced with some workers that, that you've met with just sort of like some of those symptoms of secondary trauma, like maybe calling out of work or, or sometimes like having that disengagement or can you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, funny you say that because uh, a statistic that I kind of came across in uh, looking through some of this information, just prepping myself for today, was that uh, child welfare social workers are two times more likely to experience secondary traumatic stress than uh, other types of social workers. And uh, the other thing is, but they don't see it in themselves, right? So um, they're, they're experiencing the situation, but they don't kind of self-identify that they're going through it. Um, and then, uh, but the the flip side of that is their peers see it. So they're not able to identify it in themselves, but their peers can see like, ah, oh, something's going on. There's some um, secondary trauma that that person's experiencing. And um, so in terms of team dynamics, uh, one of the things that we um, talk about a lot uh, in child welfare is teaming, you know, using that teaming approach, both internally within, within our offices and within our, our units, but also um, out in the field with the families that we're working with. And so um, when we think we, we get into the state where we feel the world is unsafe and we need to protect ourselves and preserve and, you know, self-preservation, it really, it, it it impacts trust and your ability to work alongside others and to even reach out for help and have somebody else support you. So um, not only is it that you don't help your peers, but you don't ask for help yourself and it starts to become very isolating. And um, this can play itself out within, within social work teams, also within, um, um, uh, within uh, um, working out with families. And if you think, if we have unresolved secondary trauma that we haven't really worked through as we move up through the leadership ranks, you know, and we start to, um, and that hasn't been resolved, it can also impact the supervisor's ability to um, really team with their own units, so. Right, so then there, there, there are a lot of different impacts to their work, especially as they start to take on some of this, um, you know, onto themselves or onto their work or, or their team. And, and so it, it could have even those feelings of um, resentment in a way of just like, you know, if I'm taking on other people's caseloads as maybe they're calling out of work, um, it starts to, you know, become very like, um, almost like a domino effect. It impacts mm -hmm. more people as it impacts one person. Yeah, yeah. And you, you actually called on that and I didn't call it out, but um, because one of the things that also can happen with this is, um, somatic symptoms. So like, you know, uh, stomach issues, headaches, those types, back pain, you know, all those types of things where now you're out on leave for a long period of time. And yeah, what that happens is then somebody has to pick up my caseload when I'm out. And then if you have somebody else who's now having their own trauma and they're self-preserving, you know, like it does, it does end up in some of that resentment. And not to mention that's inconsistency in relationships for families who are really trying to keep their, their children in their home and create safety. And so that inconsistency in services can uh, have a greater impact on the community as well. So. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I'm sure folks who are listening to this, they're like, oh gosh, yeah, that might be, I might be experiencing this or I might be feeling this. And um, rest assured, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the antidotes of just kind of how to you know, approach that a little bit later in our episode today. But I kind of want to go back and, and give a little bit more context just in terms of the uh, the trauma aspect of it is, I remember when I was talking to you before, just sort of learning a little bit about the six guiding principles. I, I, I That was really stood out to me. I, I didn't never sort of learned about that before. So can you mm -hmm. give us some context into um, those six guiding principles? Yes, yeah. So um there are six guiding principles to trauma-informed care. And um, the first one is safety. So, um, and kind of backing up on that, uh, one of the approaches that we really wanna take in our um, work is uh, we don't wait for trauma to, or secondary trauma or somebody's trauma to appear. We, we approach our work from our very first contact with the possibility that trauma has occurred. And so what that means is that we don't um, evoke a reaction in somebody that might um, 
that might impact them because of their traumatic experience, because we are using this six guiding principles whenever we work with our peers in the work environment or out in the field. And so that just reduces the, the uh, possibility that we uh, might impact somebody negatively because of their traumatic experience. And so we always want to use these six guiding principles in everything that we do because we are using that, that um, we are using that uh, idea that there's a possibility that trauma has occurred here. So it's almost like a rule out as opposed to a rule in, right? Uh, and so the first one is safety. So how do you really create that safety within um, your teams? So uh, making sure that you are um, using language that you you won't be really like activating some trauma response out of somebody. You know, you are, um, you are um, allowing somebody to be themselves so they don't feel that they have to have that defensiveness if they are you know, experiencing so much trauma. Uh, another, another guiding, the second one is uh, trustworthiness and transparency. Uh, so uh, things that are unpredictable might cause a, a extreme anxious, anxious response in somebody who doesn't know what's going to be happening next. Um, so telling somebody as much as you can with the information that you have, being as transparent as possible, um, making it, it gives people predictability in their environments, which which people really need if if things have been so topsy turvy and like unable to really know what's happening next. So even if it seems like it's over communication, that uh, is very helpful. And, um, and then that's, you know, just being trustworthy, like keeping your word, saying what, doing what you said you were going to do. If something happens that's unforeseen that you didn't expect to happen, you go and you communicate that. I didn't expect that this was going to happen. I know I said I was going to do this, but I have new information now. So that's that second principle. Um, the third one is peer support. So uh, we oftentimes in child welfare talk about our safety networks for families, but social workers also need them. And really thinking like who is in your circle of support, who can you rely on, um, who's that person or people who you can really trust to lean into. Um, collaboration and uh, mutuality. So having a shared responsibility, you know, being able to lean on one another, understanding like you'll scratch somebody's back sometimes while they scratch yours back, right? So we're all in this together to be able to, um, to approach this and anything that we can do as a team is really um, a, a guiding principle and trying to encourage that within the work environment. The next one is empowerment and choice. Uh, so allowing people to have decisions over what happens within their work environment. And um, we, we want to apply that to families as well as within the work environment. So, um, you know, giving people choices over what's going to happen and getting feedback and uh, empowering people in the environment they're, that they're working in. And then the last one that's on there is cultural, historical, and gender issues. So really, you know, applying that individuality to that situation based upon where that individual is coming from, from their own cultural background. Um, so those are the six guiding principles that really we want to be using at all times that we're um, uh, working with, uh, both in the office and out in the field. Nice. Yeah, that definitely gives us some good foundational, foundational knowledge and good context. Um, so, you know, before we do go into sort of more of the, the antidotes or more of the different ways we can, um, you know, support our, our workers or have our workers support each other, um, was there anything else you'd want to kind of bring up um, just in the terms of the, the context or the foundation behind the, the trauma-informed care? Yeah, I think the other thing to uh, just keep in mind as we're thinking through this is that the person who's experiencing that trauma, trauma or crisis, they really define it for themselves. So um, you may say, hmm, that incident didn't seem like it was that big of a deal. I don't understand why the response is this way. Uh, we don't understand individuals' background or um or, or context of what they're applying to that. So, you know, there may be something where it seems like a minimal incident, but that person really reminds them of their grandma and that just hits a little too close to home. And so we never really know what is going to be the incident that really impacts somebody. And, and sometimes it is the fact that, we, you know, our, um, I always say sometimes my skin was just thin that day and it impacted me a little bit more than it would at other times, you know, like I might be a little lower in sleep and I just, you know, like I'm, that, that just, you know, got me a little bit different than it would otherwise. So, so really um, leaving that open to our assessment of how um, the staff are going through a situation and just allowing for that dialogue to understand how it's impacting them, where you might not, uh, from your own lens, feel like mm, that was a serious situation. So we tend to, we tend to only um, assume that that, that trauma 
that trauma impact has happened when it's what we call a critical incident, so like a child death or something like that. And then we're, we assume that that's where that tra traumatic experience is going to be um, really uh, reacting in somebody. I love that you mentioned that because it, it, do, it does bring in that sort of like parallel process that it, it comes into play where maybe we're interacting with, with families that um, something was activating for them that day or so, like a conversation kind of led that and then sort of the impact comes up. And it, it also parallels to maybe how when, say, the supervisor is talking with their worker about a case and something about that case really activated something for the worker. And so mm -hmm. being able to kind of see that there's so many different impact points um, where that can come up and that, that crises or that impact um, shows up differently for each person. And so being able to honor that it does have a different impact and that we can sort of um, you would have that conversation with them, that openness with them to explore, you know, what, what was happening for you there? What, what was coming up for you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely that those open dialogues, those open-ended questions, you know, making sure that we're providing space for that, that conversation. Is, mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's, let's start to really give folks, you know, what are some ways that they can approach this in, in, in trauma-informed care so that they're able to have more capacity to be able to really approach their work. So I know a lot of times it's being able to develop some of the, the slowing down parts, being able to heal, um, being able to have some, you know, extra resilience sometimes going into the field. So um, what are some aspects that you can share around just that and some antidotes? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, if I, if I want to kind of lay some groundwork for the first, first thing is that uh, I think in this field, sometimes we have a fear that if something's impacting us, that somehow it might communicate that we're not cut out for this work, right? And so sometimes that's the first barrier to get over is that we need to say, hmm, this one's really weighing on me. It doesn't mean that I'm not that I'm ill-equipped for this position. It doesn't mean that I, you know, have to make some major decisions about uh, uh, where I'm going in my career field. It may just be an indicator that we need to slow down for right now and heal ourselves and be able to move forward later. So I just wanted to call that out first, that we need to have that acceptance from the get-go. Um, and with that, we want to have some open conversations around self-care and vicarious trauma. Um, and, um, you know, increasing our self-awareness. When we talked earlier about like that peer support, we want to be able to um, lean on our peers to gather feedback and like how we're handling things. If you remember, you know, just a few minutes ago, I mentioned that uh, it's extremely likely that this happens to this to workers in this field, but they don't see it, but their peers do, you know? So being open to um, seeking that feedback from others is extremely important so that if you're not seeing it at first, you, you um you are um, seeking that feedback because how it might come out is, wow, I have really difficult families on my case right now. I just can't believe all of the families are extremely difficult right now. And that might just be your emotional shutting down of withdrawing from engaging because of a traumatic response, you know? And so, um, so it can look like, eh, I've just been dealt a, a rough hand right now, but you might not really see that that's what's going on. So being able to seek that peer support. Um, and then one of the other things is um, taking into consideration um, <clears throat> leadership and their own experience with trauma. And I know that I mentioned that a little bit earlier, um, <clears throat> but making sure that um, that trauma gets resolved. So if if we have a situation where we're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't know if I want to deal with this. Like it might mean that I'm not cut out for it. And then we, we never resolve it and we kind of move up through the ranks. And now your role is to support your own staff and their own trauma. And hearing those stories just reinvokes some of that traumatic situation that maybe um, you as a supervisor has gone through and have not healed from. And <clears throat> if your walls are high and you're not wanting to really feel some of those emotions, it might really impact the ability to... Um, to um, support your staff. So even if you're in that leadership role and you're not going out and, you know, doing some of that work, the need to heal yourself also is extremely important. And so, you know, just calling that out too. Um, and then, um, so uh, when we say like, you know, the idea that we don't want to really um, say like, oh, I'm worried that this is impacting me, that leadership really, uh, you know, um, um, 
demonstrating self-care is important. Uh, what we tend to do is, you know, we don't go in this field because we don't like to help other people. We tend to be caretakers, right? That's, that's why people go into social work. And so um, what you have is you have social workers going out in the field and they're, they're absorbing everything from that family because um, we're caretakers. And, and then what happens is that social worker goes back into the office and, you know, staffs a case with the, with the supervisor. And that supervisor also being a caretaker just absorbs that from that supervisor, right? And so as opposed to um, really thinking through what we need for ourselves, we tend to absorb absorb what others need um, because that's we're helpers you know like that, that's just what we do that's what drew us to this field and so really making sure that leadership is dem demonstrating self-care and expressing vulnerability saying this is something that's hard for me to handle I need to take care of myself and really you know slow down for a little bit so that I can come back as a whole healthy employee here um, also demonstrates that unit like that's okay that's okay to go out for a little bit and, you know, take the afternoon and really center yourself because what you've dealt with is hard based upon your own experiences. So that's another antidote, just that. Um, having self-care, demonstrating self-care, um, and vulnerability. Um, and... Um, being, being aware of the symptoms of vicarious trauma. So we mentioned some of those earlier. They might come out as... And, and when, I, when I said earlier... Oh, burnout. We, we hear, oh, she's just burnt out. She's just burnt out. He's just burnt out, right? And so um, sometimes we, we miss uh, label secondary trauma as burnout. And, um, and that's not necessarily what it is. And so really being aware of those symptoms that it can come out, you know, um, behaviorally, it can come out cognitively, it can be some ruminating thoughts, right? That's just kind of continually going through your your mind it can come it can be um, emotional that sadness anger depression it can be um, physical that back pain that headache you know uh, getting sick you know things like that that maybe we're not labeling it as um, secondary trauma vicarious trauma but it's really something that we need to be aware of so if, you, if you're not feeling wellness maybe slow yourself down and really think hmm, what's going on here what what is uh what's happening because uh, it might not even be that a certain case or referral is coming to mind a lot. You just suddenly start experiencing some symptoms and unless we slow ourselves down, we're not really realizing that. So. Well, yeah, a lot of what you're talking about is, is almost a sort of shift in, shift in culture, both from the, the, the leadership standpoint where they're allowing sort of an openness to be able to kind of bring this up or an openness to be able to talk about, hey, you know, like I, I may be experiencing this, um, but also like I'm modeling what it could look like to, to have self-care or modeling what it could look like to be transparent and open in, in discussing this. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a shift in culture on the leadership standpoint, but also in a way a shift in culture on the worker where there becomes more of an increased awareness. Because um, a lot of times, even with, you know, um, mental health, for example, like just having an awareness of, you know, aspects of symptoms or aspects of, hey, this is what's coming up for me. Mm -hmm. It gives a little bit more of that control of, okay, now that I've identified like this is happening to me, mm -hmm. I can actually approach it. I can actually make it tangible to be able to work through. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then it becomes a, a point where just having more of a, of a consistency of, of checking in or a, a consistency of um, like, having that, you know, time with the supervisors to be like, Hey, you know, like, you know, you brought this up last week or two weeks ago, is that still happening? Or is that still showing mm -hmm. up for you? So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it builds just sort of this culture of like care for one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, given a lot of good details in terms of what trauma-informed care looks like, the foundations behind it, the statistics, and even the, the antidotes that, that are going to mm -hmm. help with that. So mm -hmm. um, as we kind of start to, to get towards the tail end of our episode today, are, are there any like final takeaways or last words you'd like to share just on this topic for our, our listeners? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, think of some, think of some questions that you can regularly ask one another to really just slow yourself down and approach your work with that, um, that, um, you know, mindset from the get-go that, that trauma may have happened here. And what are some questions that you can ask of though your peers, your, um, those who you supervise, those who are around you, um, to, um, be able to, um, 
allow that open space and dialogue for it. I mean, a simple question would be like, what's um, what's on, what's on your mind a lot lately? You know, like what what what's bothering you right now? You know, like those types of things that are just very open questions. Um, what cases keep coming to your mind? What cases are uh, are you can't you can't stop thinking about right now? You know, like those types of things. And it may be the simplest one, and you, and you don't really know, but really keeping those dialogues open as opposed to how are you handling that critical incident, because um, we're ruling all the other cases out. Um, so just, you know, having those open dialogues and, and being self-aware and leaning on peer support, so I think is, is really important. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely what I heard there is almost like beyond just checking in on the case, checking in on the person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate our, our time together today and being able to, you know, hear a lot about your your experience and, and just sort of the, the background that you have um, in working with folks in, in terms of this trauma-informed care lens. So, you know, thank you for, for being on with us. Um, definitely want to say uh, to our listeners, you know, thank you for tuning into this episode and we'll be back with you next time for another episode of the Coaching Corner podcast. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you.